how would you answer the question, what constitutes a successful church? How would you answer that? I think most people in the United States would respond by listing at least four things. The number of people attending, the amount of money given, the facilities or the building, and the programs that were offered. In other words, a successful church to many people is a large church with more and more people coming in all the time. It's a church with a large multi-million dollar annual budget. A church with a large, attractive, user-friendly building. And then a church that has programs to meet every need. A program for or a ministry for singles, for divorced people, for addiction recovery, for college age, for youth, for children, and on and on you could go. I think that's how many, many people would describe a successful church. And when I hear some of my fellow preachers, and I'm talking about preachers across the board, but when I hear them talking about how their church is doing, they almost always focus on the same things. Our numbers are increasing. We're meeting our budget. We are either in a building program or we're about to get into one, and we have many programs that are in place and many more that we're going to begin very soon. My question is, is that really the measure of success? If it is, then as a congregation, we're pretty much a dismal failure because our numbers have been decreasing in recent years. All of you know that. This is an unusually large crowd for us, and since you know, but our numbers have been decreasing. I want to just share something with you to get, get to a point. Back in this congregation's early days, there was a regular column in the Vandalia Church Bulletin called Citywide Attendance. Every week, it listed the previous week's attendance figures for the churches of Christ in the city. I'm not even sure how they got all those figures or, or who did it. It was very interesting. So I went back. We have, we have bulletins that go way back to the very beginning. And I picked out November 6, 1959. That's 55 years ago this week. On the list, Broadway was in first place with 1,108 in attendance. Guess who was second? Vandalia, with 589 people, almost 600 people in attendance in this congregation. We were ahead of sunset. Fifteen churches were on that list. And here's an interesting fact. Eight of those churches of Christ no longer exist. Half of them are gone 55 years later. And not all of those that... Uh, that disappeared were necessarily small, struggling churches back in 1959. Do you remember the Pioneer Park Church? Uh, that Sunday, they had 450 people in that congregation. Of course, since that time, although half of those churches are now gone, since that time, there have been new congregations, Monterey, uh, South Plains, to name a couple. And of interest to me, it doesn't really have much to do with the point I want to make, but of real interest to me was that none of our non-Sunday school, non-institutional, one-cup, mutual ministry churches were, were mentioned at all. I guess they didn't matter. We didn't even mention any of those congregations of the churches of Christ. But my point is this. At one time, Vandalia was much, much larger than it is now. In fact, we are 75% smaller than we were 55 years ago. Does that mean that we failed? If numbers are the indicator, we have, or we're failing. But I don't believe that at all. Now, I realize we live in a culture that, by and large, thinks that bigger is better, especially when it comes to institutions and organizations, right? Right? Well, we think bigger is better. Everybody knows that a large university is better than a small one, right? 
I mean, everybody knows that a degree from Texas Tech is better than one from Lubbock Christian University, right? Wrong. The only advantage Texas Tech has over LCU is the ability to offer more degree programs and to do some research. But there still is the mindset in this country that surely a university of 30,000 students has got to be better than a university of 2,000 students. And that attitude exists when it comes to the church. Large churches are better than small ones, right? We all know that. Now, I, I've got to say, I have nothing against large churches, okay? Nothing at all. They, they can do some things that small churches cannot do. But what I want us to get away from is the idea that small churches are somehow inferior, that smaller churches are somehow handicapped. But so many people still have that that mindset. Families often leave small churches to seek out larger congregations mainly because of the programs that are offered. And smaller congregations are often branded as being unwilling to grow or they're dull or they're dead. And certainly some smaller churches fit that description. But that isn't the conclusion that we have to draw. So for the next couple of weeks, today and at least one more Sunday, I want to talk about the strategically small church, and I take that from a book by that same, that same title. Now, I don't want to idealize Vandalia because we're far from being an ideal church, but what I want to do is to encourage you to recognize and realize the potential that a small church has and the potential that we have. Now, the first thing I want you to know is this, because I, I'm gonna, I, I think I'm going to dispel a myth. We live in a country of small churches. The problem is we have highlighted a, a few large and spectacular churches believing they're the norm, and they are not the norm. There are a little over 300,000, get that, 300,000 Christian churches in the United States of America. And according to one study, the median or the average attendance on a Sunday morning is 75. But another study reported that the average attendance is probably more like 58. 300,000 congregations, and the median attendance might be 58. About 180,000 of those 300 churches have fewer than 100 people each Sunday. That means that we're bigger than 60% of the churches in this country right now. Now, I realize there are megachurches. There are about 1,500 megachurches, and that's defined as a church with more than 2,000 members. Do you realize 1,500 of those constitutes less than one-half of 1% 1 of all the churches in the United States? We think that's the norm. But it, it's, it's one half of 1%. There are only 19,000 churches among that 300,000 that have over 500 in attendance. That's 6%. So we are a country of small churches. And there's nothing wrong with that, is there? Is there something wrong with small churches remaining small? Is there something in Scripture that says every church has just got to be growing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger? Is there something to indicate that in, in God's Word? Is there something wrong if budgets don't increase every year? Is there something wrong if, if we're content with the facilities that we currently own and, and, and we feel like we don't have to go into a multi-million dollar building program? Every congregation that honors Jesus as Lord has a role to play in the kingdom drama that is unfolding day by day. And I want to share an analogy with you. This is not mine. I got this really from David Langford uh, at Quaker Avenue. In fact, uh, the Quaker Avenue congregation is using some of this material in their small groups. And that's why Marlon and Carol Pointer are here, because I wanted them to hear this and, uh, and tell me if I was right or wrong. <laughs> so, Marlon, afterwards you can tell me. But um, anyway, this analogy, and then I, I've, I've refined it. I've well, not refined it, but I've just done some of my own research. But I think you'll understand 
and get the point real quick. The United States Navy has 430 commissioned vessels that make up the naval fleet, 430 vessels. Did you know not all of them are aircraft carriers? Did you know that? The carriers are the mega ships of the fleet. And they're impressive. Do you realize that there are some of our aircraft carriers that have 5,000 crew members on board? 5,000 people on one vessel. That's impressive. Those are the mega ships. But you know, our Navy also has frigates that carry about 200 people. And submarines carry about 100 crew members. And survey ships, about 50. And minesweepers, about 30. And yet all of those vessels are important to the overall success of naval operations. In our Navy right now, today, there are 10 aircraft carriers. That's it. 10 aircraft carriers. That's 2.5% of all the ships. Folks, you can't have a Navy made up only of aircraft carriers. You have to have support vessels as well, like tankers and cargo ships and harbor tugs. And those ships are not very glamorous. They're not spectacular. They don't have planes taken off and, you know, they're, they're, they're not like that. But they are absolutely essential. In fact, the aircraft carriers can't operate without those other vessels. That's how it is in the body of Christ. There are aircraft carriers. There are the mega churches like Willow Creek Church in South Barrington, Illinois. 24,000 people attend that church every Sunday. 24,000. And then there's the Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California. 20,000. Or Southeast Christian Church. Some of our, our, our group the Independent Christian Church. Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky has 22,000 attendees on an average Sunday. Those churches do some wonderful things in the kingdom of God. They are the aircraft carriers. They're, they're the mega churches. But on the other end of the spectrum, who will I pick out? Well, I've already done it. There's the little church of Christ in Mountain Air, New Mexico that has 12 people who attend. Skeptics will look down their nose and scoff and say, what, what, 12 people, what, what can a little church like that possibly do? Well, I'll tell you one thing they've done. They helped my brother Victor reconnect with the body of Christ. He had dropped out. But in that small group of believers, he found a family he could relate to. And he found renewed energy and he found renewed commitment. And to me, what happened to him in that little bitty church is every bit as important as anything that happens at Willow Creek or Saddleback or Southeast Christian. It's just as important. My point is simply this. It's hard to claim congregational size as a foolproof mark of success, or more importantly, of faithfulness. But it's really hard for us to accept that truth. I read about one pastor who at a conference recently said, if numbers are not important, then why does the word number come up so often in Scripture? Good question. On the day of Pentecost, following the resurrection of Jesus, we are told that those who accepted Peter's message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day, Acts 2, 41. A little later, Luke adds this, Many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000, Acts 4 and 4. 5,000 men, not counting women and children, sounds like a mega church to me. But was it really? Folks, don't imagine that all those people in Jerusalem met at one central location every Sunday and they listened to a dynamic speaker and they were entertained by a fantastic praise band and there's a little coffee shop over in the foyer and the temple police are directing traffic. Don't, that's not the picture. That's not what happened. 
Those new believers were meeting all over the city in smaller groups in homes, probably 20, 30, maybe 50 people. And then in Acts chapter 8, this group fell under persecution and they're scattered eventually all over the Mediterranean world. And the pattern even there seems to be small congregations meeting in homes and in synagogues and in public spaces. And those scattered, small, and yet vibrant congregations spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. One sociologist estimates that there may have been only about 25,000 Christians in the empire at the end of the first century. Let's think about that. 25,000 all over the empire. By the fourth century, before Constantine made Christianity legal, there may have been as many as 20 million in four centuries. That growth occurred by the efforts of small, obscure churches. Think about this. They didn't have a printing press, so they couldn't hand out pamphlets and leaflets. There was no radio, no TV, no Internet. They had no buildings. For centuries, the church had no buildings. They had few, if any, organized programs. They did not have an educated, paid clergy. But God used the faithfulness. God used the strength of those under-resourced, poorly staffed, badly programmed, and unprofessional small churches to change the world forever. And I think he still does the same thing today. Now, there's one other aspect of this that I, I want you to consider. Sometimes... Faithfulness to God's kingdom, faithfulness to his program results in obscurity. It results in the shrinking of a community of believers. Ever thought about that? The folks who say church ought to just be growing all the time, more numbers, more people, all that, bigger buildings, don't realize that sometimes being faithful to God means that the numbers actually shrink. It happened to Jesus. At one time in his ministry, he had an impressive following, did he not? The crowds were so large on some occasions that he and his disciples couldn't even sit down to eat. Thousands of people crowded around him. On one occasion, he fed 5,000 men on another 4,000 people. Everybody in the country knew his name, including the Roman authorities and the leading religious figures of the day. Pretty impressive. But as the end grew near, he slipped deeper and deeper into obscurity. And when he died, he was all alone. By all worldly standards, Jesus was a failure. Now, we know that he wasn't. We know that God was at work powerfully in what was happening in his life. But if you just look at it from a worldly standard, I mean, he didn't have anybody, there were no buildings, there was no money, nothing like that going on. He was a failure. And then I want to remind you that Jesus promised a similar fate for his disciples. Remember what he said in Matthew 10, you will be hated by everyone because of me. A little later in that same gospel, chapter 24, verse 9, he said, you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. That doesn't sound much like a formula for success. And so I just want you to know that our dominant definition of success is not supported by the story of Jesus or the story of the New Testament church. The truth is there are no successful churches. Instead, they're just communities of sinners, like right here, all of us. The greatest sinner among you is me, your preacher. But there are, there are these communities of sinners who gather before God week by week in cities and towns and villages and in the countryside all around the world. These communities are large, they're small, they're in between. The Holy Spirit gathers them and he does his work in those congregations. And numbers and budgets and buildings and programs have very little to do with what the Spirit 
can do in those churches. What matters is faithfulness. What matters is obedience. What matters is humility before God. And let me tell you why I wanted to do this, these two Sundays. I want to encourage you to not despair. I want to encourage you not to give up simply because we're not as large a congregation as we once were. And you know what? It's very possible we're going to get even smaller. That's a possibility. Don't take that as a defeatist statement at all. I, I'm more positive than ever about our congregation. I believe we are right where God wants us to be. But I want to encourage you. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged about where we are. Most of you here know the Bible well enough to be familiar with the seven churches of Asia found in the book of Revelation. There are two of those congregations about whom nothing negative is said by the Lord. Remember, he, he sent letters to all seven churches. To five of them, he says, yeah, I know what you're doing, but I have this against you. I have this against you. says it over and over. There are two, though, Smyrna and Philadelphia, that do not have a negative word. They were good, faithful churches. Mega churches, right? No, probably not. Listen to what he says. To Smyrna, Jesus says, remember, faithful church, nothing negative said about this congregation. And he says, I know your afflictions, and I know your poverty, and I know about the slander that you're enduring and about what you are going to suffer. That doesn't sound like a successful church by today's standards by today's measurements, but they were because they were faithful. And to Philadelphia, the Lord makes this comment. I know you have little strength, yet you've kept my word. Here's a small church, a weak church, evidently, numerically, but faithful. My friends, that's all we're called to be. Just faithful to the call that God puts on our congregation, wherever that may lead us. Next week, I, I want to talk about the advantages of a small church. There are some real advantages. There are some things that God can do and is doing. And I, I just hope you'll be here for that message. But I just pray that you'll be encouraged, that, that you'll be uplifted, not by how many people show up here every Sunday or about how much money comes in, but be encouraged by the potential that God, God can use in the kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, I am thankful to you for this church. Uh, for 25 years, this church has loved me, nurtured me, given me opportunity for ministry. I, I'm so grateful for Vandalia. Thankful for the people who had the vision 60-plus years ago to begin and thankful for all that's gone on. But I'm thankful for where we are right now. And I just pray that we'll, we'll surrender to you and that you will use us in the way that you want to use us. Help us not to focus on the things of this world or the things that the world thinks are important, but to put our trust and our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ and to simply have the desire to tell other people the good news of Jesus. Thank you, Father, we pray in his name. Amen.